So it's been a year, been exactly a year actually, since Marlin got her cancer diagnosis and we embarked on this journey. Fifty-four weeks ago, a year and two weeks ago, we bought this van, uh, this van that I'm sitting in right now. And buying a van was something that we had talked about, dreamed about, saved up money for, for years at that point actually. It had been a dream of ours for a long, long, long time. And the time finally came to buy a van. We found the perfect half finished project and we traveled across the country to go and pick it up. That was obviously an extremely exciting day, but even at that point it was tainted because Marlin had been having pretty terrible symptoms for several months before that, probably half a year before that at least, maybe even more. So even on that day, amidst all the excitement and all the, uh, all the positive vibes, it was tainted a little bit with this feeling of there's something wrong. We got her van! Whee! She's ours! <laughs> On the 21st of October 2022, I finally got to a doctor who actually wanted to take a look at me. Before, everybody's just said, like, you're young, you just had a baby, you don't need to worry. So on the 21st, I finally got <laughs> to a doctor, had a doctor's appointment where a doctor actually wanted to take a proper look. And I kind of could tell halfway through, not even halfway through, that they found something that didn't look good. Because you can tell when they're like whispering a little bit between the doctors and the nurses. And like before I left from that appointment, the doctor basically told me I had cancer, but obviously he couldn't because they're not allowed to until the biopsies come back. But he said like, we found something tumor-like. It looks, is really big. Uh, it does not look good you need to prepare for a long and hard journey now. And until we find out exactly what it is, it's gonna be doctor's appointments, like basically every day now. So just buckle up for a long ride, basically. Uh, and it was such a shock to me, because everybody else had said that it's fine and I don't need to worry, and didn't have it all in my head that it could ever be cancer, to be honest. I have tried, oh I have tried, yeah, to become better But I thought again if I said it, it'll last forever I think it was even more of a shock to like my parents and my brother and my family because I hadn't even said anything about me having problems. They didn't even know that I've been trying to go to the doctors for the last seven months and I've been having these problems basically. So I just called my mum at work that day like they've just told me that I got a tumour and I don't know what to do now. Crying obviously. So my mum said oh, I'll, I'll come to you straight away. <laughs> Jumped in the car and came to me. She's like oh, I'll call daddy's on his way as well. And then we just lived in that bubble until now, I think. We were told that in Sweden they'd been seeing really good results from these medical trials where they were doing cancer treatments in almost a reverse order. So rather than having a large surgery to remove the tumour and then having chemo and radiation therapy afterwards, Mollin was put on quite a modern uh, treatment schedule where they did it in reverse order. So we were told that Mollin would start with radiation therapy move on to several rounds of chemotherapy, and then when the tumours shrank as much as they possibly could get it to shrink, they would remove it with a surgery. So seven o'clock on a Friday night, I went in for a CT scan. And then every single day, except the weekends, I had doctor's appointments until the 31st of October when I actually got to hear the words that you got cancer. And it's all like such a blur when you look back at it because I don't know in what order stuff happened or when was this or how was that kind of thing. But it was just a lot. All of a sudden you realize that you're sick and the symptoms that you've been fighting and thinking that, oh, this is just normal, just push through. You accept them and then all of a sudden you feel a bit more sick, I think. It's such a kick to your mental health as well, like to try to understand that I got cancer. It still feels surreal to me now. Like even a year after, after everything we've been through, I'm like, was it really cancer? Is it really cancer? 
after that it was a whirlwind and it felt like they'd put us on a fast track to everything. The first step after we got the diagnosis came very, very quickly and it felt like we hadn't had time to sort of land in it at all. We definitely hadn't had time to, to process the diagnosis that we'd been given and we were thrown into it head first, but um, obviously looking back, it was the right way to do it. You know, tackle it as, as quickly as possible. So a very vivid memory of mine is sitting in that waiting room to get Mollin's first round of radiation therapy. The nerves and anxiety that I felt on that day, that we felt on that day, is not comparable to anything that I've ever felt before. That this was the very first step in such a long, difficult process. And we were at the very, very, very beginning of that journey on that day. I can't say that I remember too much about how I felt like physically after radiotherapy. I remember that I felt a bit like shocked after the first day because it's so fast. So I got like little tattoos on my hips and one on my like pelvic bone, I think it's called. So they like lined me up and had a cross so they know exactly that they're doing it right. You lay down here and this machine here that comes out. And then it's like, done takes like five minutes, if even that. So it goes really fast. And the first day I was like, oh, was that it? I don't feel anything, just get on with your life. But then I think even after the second day, I started to feel so tired. And it's like, not like, oh, I get tired after a bit. It was like, instantly, as soon as I walked out of that room, I was like, I feel drained. And then I remember having really sore muscles. You know, when you stretch at your tightest when you're stretching your legs for example and you're like I can't get them any straighter because it feels like my muscles are gonna snap. That's how my muscles felt when I was just sat. So as soon as I did anything it honestly felt like my muscles were gonna break. So then I felt a bit rubbish from that but I can't remember that I felt much else. It was like tiredness and a bit soreness in my body. I felt a bit sick but they also thought that was because I couldn't get enough rest and they thought that that was the connection with why I felt sick because most people don't feel sick from radiotherapy. So that was like in the end of November, I think. I think I started on the 23rd of November. All right, so uh, last day of radiation therapy and uh, we've brought the kids to uh, see where the doctors are fixing Mama's tummy, don't we? Yeah. And it's uh, just our look that there's some good toys here as well. It's great, isn't it? Yeah, so it's the last day today. Yeah. That one, yeah. During that time of uh, radiation therapy, we were given some really, really good advice that we really tried to stick to, that said, really try to take everything one day at a time. And I know that's, that's sort of quite a common thing to think, you know, well, one day at a time and all that lot, but really try and think about it. Just think about getting through today. Maybe not even that, just think about getting through this hour, these next five minutes because otherwise it's very, very easy to get overwhelmed. And if I had one piece of advice to somebody who was just starting on this awful journey, it'd be exactly that. Focus on today. And whatever comes tomorrow comes tomorrow, but just get through the day however you can. And then it was a break until chemo started, which was on the 13th of December. So I came into the hospital at like seven in the morning, I think, and they put in a pick line in my arm. And then straight after that, I went down and got chemo straight away after. So for those of you who maybe don't know what a pick line is, it's essentially a long silicon tube that they insert into your upper arm. And it goes in all the way up uh, across your chest and almost into your heart. Not quite that far, but not far, not far away. And they let me sit in the uh, surgical room when uh, she was getting it put in, and it was just an odd experience altogether. Child locks. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> First day of chemo. First day of chemo. Feeling? Nervous. Yeah. Still positive, or mostly just nervous right mostly now? Mostly just nervous right now. Yeah. So I have to take 16 of these. <laughs> Your little pill cocktail. Yeah. Chemo is hell on earth. Like I can't imagine anything worse than chemo in life. Like you could break all my bones in my body and I would rather do that before chemo. Chemo takes every single 
thing from you. It takes your joy, it takes your happiness, it takes your personality, it takes your soul. No, maybe a bit dramatic, but honestly, it takes everything from you. And then you get all the side effects on top of that, where it's like you also feel sick. Like I couldn't eat the first week of every chemo cycle. I didn't eat. I lived on green apples and what we call it, rolly bread. <laughs> Flat bread that you roll, basically. I don't know how many kilos a week the Tom bought <laughs> with green apples because it was the only thing I ate. By the end of it, they didn't know how to treat the sickness that I felt because they didn't want to take down the strength of the chemo. So they gave me medicine instead that would help the nauseous feeling. But because I am quite sensitive to medication, all of them made me sleep. So when we finally found one that worked, a little bit. It instead made me sleep for basically a full week. I always started my chemo on a Monday. So on a Monday, the kids slept at my parents' house. And on the Monday evening, Tom's dad came to our house. So on the Tuesday morning, my mom and dad came to pick me up. And then I slept from morning to evening. And like, they woke me up and said like, you need to eat something now and fed me green apple. <laughs> and then bedtime every night, they drove me in. Uh, so I could put my kids to bed every night because I didn't want my kids to not have me there at bedtime because if I was gone all the way through the day and I couldn't be present at least I wanted them to have two parents when they went to bed at night and I think that I probably fell asleep before both kids every single night of these but at least I was laid next to them in bed and they could feel me being around even if I wasn't really there and I think that was one of the hardest things for me to go through all of this to have everything the chemo does with you and then all of these awful side effects and all of this you feel and then you got two babies that you want to take care of who worry about you who want you to be close who wants you to play with them who wants you to just be a parent wants you to feed them breakfast who wants you to be just there to see them to listen to them to play to everything that being a parent is and you know when you can barely even stand up or get out of bed or even function how are you going to take care of two kids of course we had help we had all the help we could ever dream about everybody who can step up to be there all the time has been there for us all the time and helped us with the kids and done everything we could ever dream about but it's still not me who's doing it. Even if I know that somebody else is taking care of my kids, I am their mum and I want to be there for them. I want to show them that I'm not, not there for them. And that has been really, really mentally hard for me throughout this whole journey. It's so many things with the kids that's made this really, really, really difficult. Yeah, my own. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit. Oh. <laughs> the whole chemo process was was brutal. I don't think there's any other way of uh, of describing it. It was uh, yeah among the the most difficult periods of uh, both of our lives. I think so. After a dreadful dreadful few months of uh, of chemo, we had a little bit of light in the end of the tunnel, uh, so to say, where we had an appointment with Molin's uh, surgical team, where they told us that the treatment had gone really, really well, and that the tumour had responded really well to both the radiation therapy and the chemo. The amount that it had shrunk was staggering. Molin's tumour was 10 centimetres in diameter uh, when she first got the diagnosis, which is obviously massive. And when they uh, examined her after radiation therapy and the chemotherapy, it had shrunk down to almost nothing. Uh, it was just a fantastic feeling of it was all worth it. Going through those terrible few months and just so much pain and difficulty. Yeah, it was worth it. You can't turn the tide Let the water go where it wants to go Are you comfy up there, Bella? Good. Is Mama a good horse? Bury yourself beneath the stone. Somebody told me don't pretend. Cause everyone can use a friend sometimes. Take some good advice. 
We haven't talked too much about how the kids have reacted, and it's because they are two individuals with their own feelings and their own emotions and their own thoughts about all of this that we've been through, but they're not old enough to decide if they want to share it or not. So we don't feel like it's fair that we gonna share it for them. So that's why we've not talked about the kids too much. It's just out of respect for them that they are their own people, even if they're young. <laughs> and it's not up to us to share what they've been through. But what we can say is that Isabella has been a bit too young to like understand what's been going on. Uh, she's seen that I'm not around that much, but she don't really understand why. Charlie has suffered a lot this last year. He still really does. He's really sensitive to everything that's been going on and he understands a lot and he's been acting up as you would expect. He suffers a lot when I'm not around and he worries a lot about me when I'm not feeling well. Even if I just get a normal cold and I have to go to the doctors or like go and pick up medicine or I need to stay in bed for just an extra hour in the morning, he always needs to come and check on me. If somebody says like, mama is a bit tired so I'll play with you instead, he always needs to come and check on me to make sure that I'm not poorly again and how tired am I and what does that mean. And it's a lot of weight on such a small person's shoulders. And he don't understand the difference of me going to therapists in the hospital. I go and see my stoma nurse in the hospital, go and take blood tests in the hospital and all of this everybody else knows that I will come back within an hour. You don't need to worry about it but in his eyes I am still going to the hospital and he don't know which time I'm gonna have to stay in the hospital and be gone for another week or if I'm coming back within half an hour wet buns. <laughs> oh. Hey. Have oh, they got some nice toys here? Yeah. Is it good? Yeah. So after that, they scheduled in Molin's surgery for a couple of months later. And then while we were waiting for Molin's scheduled uh, surgery, uh, we got another curveball thrown at us and Molin was unexpectedly admitted to the hospital. So we ended up in A&E, uh, in the ER, where they scanned her and in the end diagnosed her with what was essentially a twist in a large intestine, which had caused a complete blockage. And pretty quickly it was action stations. Uh, they said it was a really, really serious thing that they needed to operate on uh, instantly. Uh, there is a medical term for it, a Latin term, I can't remember it. In Swedish it's Talmvred. But essentially where the tumour had sat, the uh, the wall of the intestine had become weak and twisted in on itself. So um, yeah, they were quick to operate and that was when Molin had her colostomy put in. She came out of that with a stoma. Um, they didn't uh, remove the tumour at the time, they just fixed the intestinal blockage and put, uh, put Marlin's stoma in. So then, uh, yeah, next came the, uh, the big operation, so to say. Surgery was also awful. <laughs> they said, oh, surgery on the Tuesday and then within five days you'll be home. I think I was in the hospital for two weeks because I was not feeling good and I couldn't eat. Again, all of that, I felt so sick all the time and I couldn't eat. I just, I couldn't eat and I couldn't drink. Sometimes I felt like the nurses looked at me like, just come on, just do it. But I don't know if it was from chemo or what it was, but I just could not do it. I tried and I tried and I tried and every single time I tried to eat, I felt sick. I can't really remember exactly when and how stuff was happening throughout that time either. I know I had the surgery on the Tuesday. I was really thinking that I would be home before the end of the weekend, but I wasn't. I was there for another full week. Like, obviously, surgery was not fun. I was feeling awful. I was feeling upset about missing my kids and everything. And as well, I just wanted to go home and I just couldn't get any food or drinks down. I was not feeling good at all. But I still can't remember much from that. And I don't know if it's because I was on a lot of painkillers all the time or if it's just a bit too close in time so I've not processed it enough yet. I don't know. Like a bro. Yeah. 
29 years old and I know how to walk. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> yeah, not, not far really. off at least. Not really. She did uh, a phenomenal job all the way through, to be honest. And recovering from the uh, from the surgeries was it was definitely difficult for her. But she uh, she smashed it. She absolutely smashed it all the way through. And we ended up being able to have uh, somewhat of a decent summer, even even during her recovery. She was uh, she was pushing herself to the limit without being stupid. We spent a lot of time in the van, um, enjoying the summer. And uh, we even managed to do some travelling, which was obviously quite unexpected, to be honest. But uh, yeah, but really, really nice. The the sort of level of anxiety that's been left hanging has meant that it's been uh, it's been really difficult to just sort of enjoy the moment. But you know, when you've when you take a step back and you think about the journey that you've been through and the battle, it sort of forces everything into perspective, and you're left feeling just grateful that um, that you're able to to enjoy these things. And we've really tried to uh, to see the big picture and uh, and enjoy life a little bit after that. Oi, sausage head! Are you pressing all the buttons on my steering wheel? Yeah. <laughs> For me, the hardest thing this year has been to balance being sick. Uh, accepting that having enough time to rest, giving myself enough time to rest, accepting that I am not like a normal 29 year old. I don't got energy to do the same things. I have to prioritize what I want to do because after one thing, that's it for the day. And together with treatment and trying to be a mum. And that's been the hardest thing, I think. To feel like I've been there for my kids enough. Uh, which I think that no matter if you're sick or not, you never feel like you're there enough for your kids, do you? You always feel like you could have done more. And then I've been having to leave them for so long. I feel like I missed a whole year. And it really, really hurts to think about that. Some days all you want to do is to rest. And maybe some days all you need to do is to rest. But then you feel bad because you're missing out of your kid's life and you want to be there for your kids. But when you are there for the kids or around them, then you just feel tired and you don't got energy to be like 100% present anyway. Uh, and it's a really, really hard balance to try to keep up with. So during this whole process, a dream of ours has been to sell our house and move into our van. And for those of you who follow along with the videos, you'll know that we uh, we succeeded in that recently. But it was not all smooth sailing, that either. <laughs> we'd, uh, we'd made the decision to sell the house and to move into the van to travel for the winter. Partly for the reason that Molin has a really bad neuropathy from uh, the chemo, which is essentially nerve damage, uh, mostly in hands and feet, uh, which is really badly affected by the cold. So the idea was to travel somewhere a little bit warmer for the winter. So then very recently, just as we were in the process of moving out, we'd sold the house, everything was uh, was feeling amazing and feeling very exciting. And then the week before we were moving out, uh, Molin was taken into the hospital again with a serious abdominal pain that had sort of popped up a couple of times during the recovery. And that investigation is still ongoing. We're still not exactly sure what that is. Hopefully, we'll know more soon. We can get it fixed and uh, we can get somewhere a little bit warmer for the winter. Fingers crossed that we don't have to do any of this again. And uh, if you are going through it, then uh, you'll get through it. It is shit, but try to live on the good days, even if it's really hard. When you get out on the other side, remember to live the life that you've always wanted. Don't think that I'll do it tomorrow or that I'll do it in a couple of years. If you want to do something, then start to do work for it right now because you really don't know what's waiting around the corner. And when that corner hits you, it's not good. So stop dreaming, start living and enjoy every moment that you can in life because you don't know when you get to do it again. So. Um, go out and uh, live your dream and stop waiting for the right moment to come. The right moment is now. In the end, we moved out of the house. 
We moved into the van and here we are. Our travel plans have been put on hold a little bit, so we're still in the local area in Sweden, but we are living in the van. And yeah, we're getting there. We're getting there slowly, but surely, I think. At least, you know, we're all together. We're trying to enjoy life a little bit. And we're one step closer to our dream of uh, being a bit more self-sustainable, living in a van and uh, doing a lot of traveling. Waiting for you to come home I've been so cold and been alone Suddenly I woke up from dreaming Today's the day Come back to me when you fall Thank you for watching this incredibly long video. I hope that we've not bored you and that you watched the whole thing. If you did, then well done. <laughs> so thank you guys for being an incredible support on here. Uh, we appreciate you all, even if we can't answer all the comments on every video because sometimes you just go mad and we love you for it. So thank you for watching. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye.